Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we are going to be reading deep ocean horror stories. So, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. You might have read about Bauman's Gate Cave, a.k.a. Bushman's Hole, if you're a scuba diving fanatic. It's the deepest underwater cave in the world, found in South Africa, laying low at 271 meters. You may have also heard about Dave Shaw. He's set world records, including deepest cave diving on a rebreather, equipment that lets you recycle air, in the cave that would later take his life. During his first dive there, he came across the remains of Dion Dreyer, who was taken hostage by the cave in 1994. He tried to recover the remains, but it was impossible. He promised Dreyer's dad that he'd try again. In January of 2005, Shaw embarked on his promise. It took him a mere 10 minutes to drop 271 meters to the cave's base. In video footage taken by Shaw, it's evident that he joined Dreyer in a fatality just 25 minutes into the dive. He filmed his own death. Shaw went down first to send up the remains. Surely, his dive buddy dropped shortly after, but there was no sign of Shaw. He dropped to 250 meters in his search, but Shirley's computer systems were breaking down and he had to ascend. A support diver couldn't find Shirley at their 80 meter meeting point, so he dropped another 40 meters. He received a message on a slate saying, Dave's not coming back. Days later, divers went to retrieve Shaw's equipment and discovered both bodies just 20 meters deep. Attached to the nylon line, Shaw had attached to Dryer's remains and became tangled in. In 2014, two divers were taken hostage by a 100-meter deep cave system in Norway called Steinugel Flagget Cave. In this tale, it was a case of entanglement and panic, which led to fatalities. The start of the cave is simple. You enter the pond Plora and swim underground for 500 meters to the first cave. It's well known as a beautiful dive for recreational diving, but there's more for the less faint-hearted. Go deeper through narrow channels, pitch black, ice cold water, and you reach Steinugel Flagget Cave, a recipe for only very skilled cave divers. A group of five set out to dive that day. Only three returned. At 110 meters deep, the leading diver, Grongfist, realized the second, Hartoran, wasn't behind him. He turned and found Grongfist tangled in the cord He was using his torch to alert of distress. Gronkvist gave him a cylinder of gas to reduce his carbon dioxide exposure. But while he was changing his mouthpiece, he swallowed water uncontrollably. Harturnin died in front of his eyes. Gronkvist couldn't free the body, despite his best attempts. He had to carry on. Due to this delay, Gronkvist had to add a few hours to his decompression stops. He eventually surfaced safely. Three more divers followed. Ran Tannen was next, and he managed to negotiate moving past Hontoran's body. Usamaki panicked at the scene. Ran Tannen was the final diver and tried to assist Usamaki, but without success. He returned the way he came, unfortunately having to leave his two friends' bodies.
Shane Thompson became a victim of New Mexico's Blue Hole in April of 2016. He was a member of the ADM Exploration Foundation, who were given rare permits to explore the underwater caves which were sealed for 40 years. At the bottom of the spring, there's a metal grate that stops divers from going too deep. It was placed in 1976 after two training divers died. Beneath the grating, there's a maze of twisting, turning caves. The foundation came to the Blue Hole in 2013 to attempt to further explore the Blue Hole beyond the grating. It took many attempts before they could remove the rocks above the grating. On a fateful day in question, Thompson was supposed to be on safety duty outside of the cave while fellow cave diver Young entered. For unknown reasons, Thompson went in too. Young tried to exit following a safety line, but silt had been stirred and there was no visibility. Thompson pulled the line so hard that Young let go. Then, as he was feeling for the line, Thompson became wedged against Young in a narrow passage about 35 meters deep. After freeing themselves, something went wrong and Thompson started to panic. He took a wrong turn and ended up in an unmapped offshoot, leading nowhere. He was trapped. Young eventually found Thompson, but he was already dead. Although a tragedy, Thompson's family said they knew he died doing what he loved. He started diving at a very young age and spent his life working in the industry. He'd worked for over 20 years as a technical rebreather diver and was an instructor for the Navy. It was his life. After the Thompson's death, Young announced the caves too unsafe and said that they should be sealed for good. He said they were the most dangerous caves the Foundation had ever dived. In 1991, there was a mysterious cave diving tragedy. Two dive buddies, Turner and Gavin, were mapping caves in Indian Springs in Florida, but only one came back. During the dive, current stirred silt and sand. This dropped from 30 meters to about 15 centimeters, 80 feet to 6 inches. They tried to ascend, but the passage out of the cave was blocked. Gavin managed to force his way out. But when he returned for his buddy, he was nowhere to be seen. Four divers who had already exited the water saw the water level bizarrely seem to have abruptly dropped, then kick up silt and sand. Following the disaster, the diving and geological communities were in tiffs about what exactly had happened. Having spent years designating a scientific experiment to explore all of the possibilities, in September of 2015, over 20 years after the incident, Doran Knopf, professor of physical oceanography at Florida State University, concluded what had happened. The problem arose when the divers were doing their decompression stops. They were ascending within the air pocket, causing gas bubbles to rise to the upper surface of the cave. The bubbles caused the buoyancy levels in the cave to change. It affected the stability of the rock and sediment in the walls and ceiling of the cave. So loose limestone, which weighed more, fell from the walls and ceilings of the cave, blocking the narrow passage below. Imagine a mudslide, but underwater. This is what caused the blocking of their passageway, and of course, the stirring up of the bottom, causing total visibility blackout. Agnes Milawaka, a stunt diver, tragically died in an event strangely similar to that she had acted in the movie Sanctum. A gi, just 29, the labyrinth of tunnels at Tank Caves in Australia, took her life in February of 2011. Milawaka was an adventurous cave diver who loved exploring to an obsessive degree. Her skilled cave diving abilities led to her involvement in many documentaries and diving projects. Mount Gambier in South Australia is famous for its complex combination of sinkholes, caves, and kilometers of underground waterways. 
tank caves requires expert navigation through tight restrictions and often limited visibility. A lot of the cave system is very fragile. The walls and ceiling are soft and you have to breathe carefully. If you exhale too hard, the bubbles displace the ceiling, which will then fall on you, causing bad vis or worse, small restrictions to become even tighter. Milauka dived at tank caves many times and knew it very well. Yet somehow during her last dive, she became separated from her dive buddy. She became lost after stirring up silt from the cave walls and floor. She wasn't quite able to find her way out of the cave and ran out of air while doing so. Evidence suggests that she remained very calm until her last breath. On the day she died, no one's sure of exactly what happened. She appeared to leave her buddy and never returned. They identified the location that she was last seen, but never what caused her to die. The following day, her body was recovered about 500 meters from the entrance of the cave. I was doing a deep dive certification with an instructor in Dehab, Egypt. We went down 40 meters and I did a math test to check if I was thinking straight or if I was narked on nitrogen. I aced that test. I performed it faster and better than on the surface in the comfort of an air conditioned classroom. My instructor was happy and we carried on with the slow ascent. Little did I know that I was completely narked and confused the button that blows the BCD up with the one that dumps the air. Basically, I was sinking vertically without even understanding my mistake. That's when the instructor came to my rescue and everything ended up well. Best part of the whole experience, it was all on film. And the people in the dive center saw it and kind of congratulated me on being alive. When I saw the video, I was amazed at how happily stupid I looked. Smiling and kicking my fins thinking I am going up, while actually descending deeper. That was a good lesson for me to not underestimate the nitrogen narcosis and the effects that it has on the mind. This happened on my first proper free dive, and I've since learned that I'm terrified of the ocean. So this probably isn't that scary to most people. However, I was on a boat tour that stopped off in a small bay with a great, beautiful, crystal clear, light turquoise water and nearly white sands. We just finished swimming with some stingrays when the tour guide offered to take some of us out for a swim in deeper water. I was hesitant as he said the current can get quite strong and I'm not the best swimmer, but he said that I could join them for as long as I felt comfortable. So I came along. There was a small group going at a leisurely pace that I could clearly see, so I decided to do some free diving. As I said, the water was gorgeously clear. I was diving down to these little reef outcrops and checking out the fish and had barely looked ahead of me other than to check on the group. I finished inspecting another little coral group and turned around to see where the group were and suddenly saw the sandy seafloor disappear over a knife sharp drop. The water was so deep and inky blue, with no seafloor in sight, and my stomach somehow dropped into my butt and jumped into my throat at the same time. I surfaced as soon as possible and got as far away from the drop off as possible and tried to pretend that I never saw it. Not too creepy, but a basic straightforward scare. I was descending for a wreck dive in Roatan, Honduras, when a really large Monterey eel emerged from the wreck and made a beeline to me and my husband. We were startled and swam away. It followed us, then dropped back. 
Next, we watched it approach our dive master, who was facing the other way and distracted helping another diver. We were desperately trying to get his attention about the imminent attack. Then we saw it wind itself through his legs and twirl around him for a few pats and discover that it's a friendly eel. We learned later that other people had been feeding it, and it was habituated to humans. That's info that I would have appreciated up front, so we wouldn't have been so scared. Pretty much anything that moves under the water is creepy if my head is above water. Under the water, it's the opposite. Nothing bugs me. I've gone diving with sharks many times. They don't make me nervous at all. Jellyfish do though, especially in Southeast Asia. The one time that I was really spooked was skin diving in the Galapagos. I went down quite deep, maybe six to seven meters. Well, deep for me. I see an absolutely massive manta ray lying on the sea floor. Bigger than me, maybe by about 40 kilos, maybe more. I continued on my way looking at the colorful fish. When it came time to ascend, I turned towards the manta again. It had been tracking my movement and moving towards me. When I looked at it, it stopped. I felt like it was up to no good. It felt very threatening. It didn't like me being there or something. Maybe it thought I was lunch. I don't know. I got the F out of the water and went to have a beer to calm my nerves. I've dove a number of wrecks that were graves. Many lives lost and remained still in the wreck. Spookiest, though, would be diving through a large ship that was lying on its side. So easy to get disoriented. An experienced diver in the front kicked up a bunch of silt, so even with a torch it was blackout conditions, and no chance to see where the guide was or know the way out. Scuba diving in Vanuatu on the President Coolidge, very famous wreck dive that you can walk from the shore and dive down about 15 meters all the way down to 70 meters. I was 14 at the time and my parents were lifelong divers. We dived the Coolidge twice that day already and our guide offered a night dive to us. We were supposed to only dive down to a depth of 25 meters and check out these flashlight fish that would school together in a cargo hold. They had these really bright green eyes that looked amazing and lit up underwater. I still don't really know what happened that night, but it felt like we were staring at these fish forever. Suddenly, I didn't feel right. My breathing felt funny. I tried to grab my gauge to check how much air I had left. It took every bit of muscle I had to reach for my gauge connected to my waist. I slowly grabbed it and read that I had about a half a tank left. Relieved for a split second, but still concerned something was wrong. I reached for my mom to signal her something wasn't right. I grabbed her arm, but couldn't hold on. I just started sinking to the bottom. My mom quickly grabbed my arm as I fell, but I had no leg movement. So I started dragging her to the bottom with me. My dad now realizes something's wrong and grabs my mom trying to pull us up. The dive guide now is freaking out and trying to make sure that everyone is all right. They all start swimming me back up and into shore. Once we got up closer, I started to feel normal again, but a bit dazed and confused. Turns out I had nitrogen narcosis and had dropped to about 40 meters when I couldn't swim anymore. For those of you who don't know what nitrogen narcosis is, it's when you have too much nitrogen in your body and it gives you an intoxicated effect. Nothing too hectic, but still. A vivid memory of thinking that I was going to sink to the bottom of the ocean, not being able to do anything about it.
I was scuba diving at a shipwreck. Awesome experience. Very dark though, which had me on edge. Not a very well preserved wreck, but it was awesome to see everything down there. There was a huge expanse of open water to the side of the wreck that kind of began to slope off. And as we left the wreck, we saw a huge tiger shark floating in that open water. My friends and I just swam back to our ship slowly, and it didn't really follow. But if you know anything about tiger sharks, you know how aggressive they can be, and how menacing one would look underwater. Seeing something like that in that environment, with that level of darkness, it was evening, was terrifying. The fact that it could hurt you if you wanted, and you can't do anything about it makes it ten times worse. All you can really do is keep calm and keep your distance. Remembering this around large, dangerous aquatic animals has always worked for me, and I've never been harmed. In hindsight, it was a very beautiful moment, but I definitely didn't think that at the time. I do a fair bit of cave diving in northern Florida and help out with exploration projects. I've got a couple. One is mine and one is a friend's. So my friend was checking lead in an offset sink to see if there was any going cave one afternoon. Offset sinks are physically distant from the main cave conduit. So while a primary trunk passage may have lots of clear groundwater, an offset sink won't get much water circulation. So rainwater will run off and tend to stay there for a long time. They're typically very murky and brown, clearing as you approach the main cave passage. He's about 100 feet in, at a depth of 40 or 50 feet. Nothing insane, but it's braille diving. Trying to feel his way around while running a line to see if anything goes. He comes across a wall about a foot in front of him that looks a bit unique. Oftentimes you'll see cool patterns of mineral buildup in cave walls, floors, and ceilings. So he's appreciating this cool pattern when that pattern opens its mouth and shows off its teeth and tongue. Turns out, a not insignificantly sized gator lived in that sink and wasn't happy about the home invasion. He set a new speed record getting back to the surface of that particular sink. Gators aren't uncommon down there and they usually leave you alone. But not when you get that close to them in their own territory. My story was a bit less exciting, but pretty somber. I was doing a dive in the back of a fairly regularly traveled cave system, but in an area where a body had been recovered from about a mile back the week prior. That area isn't as regularly dived due to the logistics and cave passage geometry. It's not a small dive to get back there. The recovery was real challenging, and there were signs of damage to the cave as we swam along where the body had been forced through restrictions, through mud, etc. But the real reality check came when we found his mask in the mud several thousand feet back. It had been dislodged, along with his nose, while the recovery divers tried to force him through a small area. It really drove home the reality of where I was, and what I was doing, and the respect necessary for the environment. I was surfing Scripps Pier in San Diego about six years ago. It was flat, onshore wind, really messy conditions, but I spent 40 minutes driving there and said, I'll just get into the water and paddle around a bit. There was nobody in the water. I decided to paddle around the pier, going from the north side to the south side. When I reached the last pylon, a huge fin popped up maybe five feet in front of me. I knew instantly it was a massive white shark. 12 to 15 feet based on the size of the fin. I've been surfing my whole life. I've been in the water with dolphins many times. This was 100% not a dolphin. This fin was more triangular with a serrated backside, almost like a steak knife, with a sandpaper looking texture. Dolphins have more scoop in their fin and very smooth texture on their skin. 
The way it swam gave me instant chills. Fishy, more side to side and straight than the classic up and down coming up for breath dolphin. I froze, trying to control my panic, waited for it to disappear, and as smoothly as possible turned my board around, paddled through the pier, back to land. It was absolutely checking me out, but didn't show any interest towards me. Since then, I'm not that afraid of sharks, but I still get the chills thinking about that day. I was in the Navy. Going through the Bermuda Triangle, there was this intense storm. They called away low visibility watch in the middle of the night, so different people go to different places on the ship to see ahead or behind and tell the bridge if they see anything. I was in the HCO tower, looking over the flight deck. I was in a destroyer. The lightning was so intense that there were no breaks. It was like daytime torrential rain, but the water was as smooth as glass, other than the rain hitting it. It was weird. Also, our magnetic instruments went haywire. Second story. Somewhere between Oahu and Kuwaiti, a green object appeared at night, so bright that it lit up the inside of the bridge and then followed the ship. I was asleep and heard about it from the bridge watch the next day. It was logged, so it happened. I will tell you that it got a lot of talk going, and I learned from more senior sailors that most of them have a UFO sighting story, and that for anyone that has spent a long time on the sea, they have seen something. Not really creepy, but still kind of weirds me out. First deployment on a submarine. Reactor scram drill. Lost propulsion. I get backup propulsion on the line and they start restarting the reactor. Supervisor says, you feel that? I reply, no. He says we're sinking out. They get the reactor back up and the engineer announces to expedite getting main propulsion online. Normally calm, but there's a hint of panic in his voice. Shifting back is a bit touchy for technical reasons, so normally you do it a bit slowly. Supervisor shoves me out of the way and does it so fast smoke literally comes out of the panel. All gets well soon, but I hear later that a bunch of people were watching the depth indicator. Kind of looks like an odometer. Just spinning as we went down. As I heard it, we did slightly exceed max operating depth. Also... Hearing active sonar from inside the boat is kind of creepy. I was diving just off the coast of Okinawa, a relatively small island south of Japan at night with a couple of buddies. We were making our way down approximately 150 feet when we hit the bottom and see a four-door sedan just sitting down there. We all kind of gurgled at each other in surprise and made our way over to it. Inside was a briefcase, a kid's school backpack. In Japan, all the kids wear the same style of backpack and it's very distinctive. And a couple of coffee mugs, but no bodies or anything. I was familiar with the model of car and it wasn't more than five years old. Everything was pretty well preserved, too. In retrospect, I wish I had opened the potato box to see if there was paperwork for the car, but it didn't feel right to disturb the well-preserved scene. After we made it back to shore, I started doing research into accidents in the area, but there was absolutely no record of anything related to what we found. Kind of creepy, but also cool. I'm just glad there weren't any bodies. P.S. We did let the local police know about it and give them the coordinates on our way out of the area. But we never heard anything else about it.
I remember a couple of years ago, a buddy of mine had rented a boat out for my birthday to go out to sea with. It was going perfectly fine. The boat was super nice, good for fishing, and had a great deck. When he told me he was going to rent one, I thought to order a new fin to scuba with. It was a mono fin since I had never gotten the chance to use one. I've been practicing with it, so it was perfect to use it out in the sea. We started to go off the coast of the Cape, and the water was a bit chilly, but not ice cold. We were maybe 22 miles from the coast while still having an eye sight of the shore. My friend brought fishing bait and rods for us to use later on, but after I was finished scuba diving. I was ready to get off the deck of the boat with my wetsuit and monofin, my tank resting on my arm before I was going to dunk in. After a couple of minutes, I had this really weird chill down my spine. Not paranoia, but superstition. I brushed it off and put my tank on my back, followed by my goggles. I felt that weird superstition feeling again, but it quickly switched to paranoia when I saw a pair of glistening eyes in the ocean. At first, what I thought was a shark had not been a shark. I've used my fair share of training for six years with sharks and other deep ocean water creatures, so I thought I'd be able to handle this. It slowly started making its way towards me when I got a better glimpse at it. It was huge, and I mean massive. Its teeth were poking on the side of its jaw and even had razor-sharp fins. And how I knew that this wasn't a shark was because they have more smooth, rubbery type of flesh. This one had scales like a snake. Blood was pouring out of its mouth. It looked like it was ready for its next meal. I attempted to hurry, but I was in shock, and I thought that I was going to die from shock from this thing eating me. I finally cut out of the shock moment, and it started to swim more swiftly, but the monofin could only go so fast in the water. My buddy was getting a little suspicious that I hadn't come up with anything from the depths of the ocean. He looked over the boat deck, and I guess he could see me attempting to swim for my life as a dark shadow was inching closer. I eventually reached the boat, and out of breath, I told him to book it. We ended up not using the boat for the rest of the day and went home. To this day, I have no idea what it was, but in all of my years of experience, I don't want to find out. I was 18 meters down when my air went bad. It had a weird metallic sugary taste to it, and I started losing consciousness. I pointed myself up and pulled my BCD, my buoyancy compensator, and about six meters from the surface I blacked out. When I woke up, I was being hauled into the dive boat. I blew both my eardrums and haven't been able to dive since. I got very lucky because I could have drowned. One time when my parents visited Mexico, they went diving and my mom was slightly lower down than my dad looking at the ocean floor. My mom had on a gold necklace that was floating in the water around her. It was a sunny day and a fairly shallow dive, so it was sparkling. My mom looked down below at all the critters when my dad grabbed her and started frantically shaking her arm to get her attention. She looked up and a barracuda was directly in front of her, staring intently at the shining necklace. She slowly moved up her hand to cover her necklace, and they slowly and calmly moved away from it, and it took off without bothering them anymore. But still, pretty unsettling, and taught my mom to be a little more aware of her surroundings when diving. I got the bends once. I was careful and followed my charts and computer. I had appropriate depths and surface time, but I didn't drink enough water, 
so I was all out of whack. I felt fine until I got home and had a mild headache. Then I woke up and it was just pain in my left arm, elbows, and fingers. I was then rushed to the hospital. The doctors got me hooked up and on fluids, checked my dive logs while the decompression chamber was set up, and then got me in there with the nurse. Eight hours in a tube, about the length of a car, but as wide as maybe a double bed. I was on oxygen and hooked up to an IV, and it was so loud with all the air rushing in. As soon as I got to depth, the pain vanished. It was crazy. I'm fine now, but I wasn't allowed to dive for a month, which sucked. But hey, the dives were pretty great. I went diving the day before a hurricane on a small South Pacific island. Out of nowhere, a black and white venomous sea snake wrapped itself around my arm. Apparently this happens from time to time before major storms. They can sense it and look for things heading towards the shore, so they don't have to put in much effort to get out of the sea. As soon as I was in the shallows, it uncurled and headed up the beach where it hid under a breadfruit tree. I thought I was going to get bitten to death by a sea snake. Turns out, I was just a taxi for a very calm, but rather rushed reptile. Our shop's founder, legendary diver Don Dibble, was going into the cave to recover the bodies of two divers who never surfaced. While looking into the entrance of the fourth chamber at around 100 feet, he got caught in a gravel slide that buried him, blacked out on the site, and took out the guideline. Don was well and truly stuck, and his buddy couldn't find him to dig him out. Don started feeling his tank run out and decided that, when it was out, he'd intentionally start swallowing air to try and pass out faster and end it quickly. He ran out, and as he was starting to drown, he had an involuntary spasm that knocked him loose. He was free, but still out of air 90 feet underwater in a cave in blackout conditions. He backed out, and his tank hit the wall right by his buddy's head. The buddy found Don, and could tell the reg was out of his mouth. So he stuck his octo on Don's mouth and hit the purge. Don didn't know his buddy had found him and was still swallowing water, so he ended up swallowing a bunch of air. He then realized that he'd been saved and they started working their way out. On the way up, Don suddenly stopped and started trying to go back down. His buddy thought he was panicking, but what Don had felt was severe pain in his abdomen. He'd swallowed a bunch of air and water that was still in his stomach, but his buddy didn't quite realize what had happened and thought Don was confused. He started trying to pull Don out of the cave, and Don kept trying to swim back down. At around 60 feet, it became moot, because they ran out of air and had no choice but to swim for it without any air. Don arrived at the service, screaming in pain from the first known case of a stomach barotrauma. There was an ambulance waiting at the surface to transport the bodies they'd gone down to collect, and instead, they took Don to a chamber to try and help him. But the available chamber only went to three atmospheres, and Don had been at nearly four atmospheres when he swallowed the air, and the deco chamber didn't compress the water. So the docs decided to use a needle to bleed out the pressure. It turned out to be a bad idea. Don became the first known person to have their stomach pop like a water balloon. It was the equivalent of about a hundred burst appendices. It took a long time, but Don did recover, and he did retrieve the bodies. Some of the gear in that pictures is from him. He also put an iron gate over the water entrance to the cave, though some people cut the gate and killed themselves a few years later. Don passed away in February of this year from COVID. I miss him.
I was exploring a system with my friend that was pretty significant siphon from the start to EOL. All line laid in that cave was on the downstream side of a large cavern, and we were convinced that there had to be an upstream, given the significant flow. The cavern was basically formed by a collapse directly in the middle of a pretty large room. The cavern is huge, but the entrance side of it is essentially a giant breakdown pile with water flowing through and around it. Well, we found a back mount sized way around it, but the problem with breakdown is that it isn't a tunnel. It's just piles of rock. So we're happily dumping line through this tunnel. My friend is in the lead. I'm following and tucking the line away slash making cleaner placements. This system is bad for percolation, and I figured we'd probably be on the line or referencing it very carefully on exit. So I wanted it to be tucked away and not an entanglement hazard. We're about 50 to 60 feet into this tunnel, and he goes around a corner about a body length ahead of me. Right about that time, I see a rock the size of a basketball come tumbling down from above me. Almost immediately afterwards, I see his fins start to back around the corner. The area I was in was big enough for one person to turn around, so I turned around and moved out, so he would have room to back in and do the same. At this point, it's zero visibility, and I've seen at least one large rock fall, so I'm on the line, feeling pretty uncomfortable, but I know I'm close to the exit, and that's when I run straight into a rock wall. The line just ends. I'm feeling up and down in its rock. I'm convinced that the ceiling has come down on us, and this is how it ends. 30 feet deep, with near full 104s. Plenty of time to think about dying. Then I realized that I'd placed that line in a little crack on the floor, where it made a 90 degree bend, and I was able to work my way around and out without issue. My friend was about 10 feet behind me, and came out of the cloud with both thumbs up, after running into the exact same situation. Nobody has been back there since. I was two staging with a guy in downstream Emerald, two man team, two stages apiece of 18 and 45, and a tow scooter for the team. We're on the way back, maybe a thousand feet from the door at roughly 150 feet, and coming up on the first stage drop. He signals me, and I turn back to see that he's braced himself against the wall, and seems to be having trouble breathing and coughing. I wait. He eventually signals okay and we continue on. We get to the stage drop to pick up our second stage. I've stowed away my empty and I've clipped off my second, getting ready to look him for gas switch when I notice he's struggling with buoyancy and using his hands. Not a great sign. He's swimming down to the line and attempting to pick up his stage, then floating up and flailing a lot. I try to get his attention but no dice. Eventually, he clips his empty stage to the line, rag dangling free, and floats back up. At this point, I'm worried. He finally manages to get his second stage clipped off while hanging on a rock on the floor. Normal gas switch procedure involves buddy verification, but he just starts going for the switch. I'm watching and realize that he never opened the stage valve, so I open it for him as he's putting the reg in his mouth. Right about then, I notice just how fast he was breathing so I'm fairly positive that he CO2'd himself, struggling with buoyancy earlier, which explains why he's acting super narked on Trimix and breathing hard. His light is off his hand and in the dirt, and he's clanging to this rock floor for dear life and refusing to get moving. Just keeps signaling hold, keeps breathing at an elevated rate. It's worth mentioning that right now, we have about 90 minutes of deco, and about 10 minutes to the door slash first deco bottles. After a few minutes, he switches off his stage and back to the back gas. I'm still on back gas, half empty stage on my side, but he's hoovering through it and still won't move. I'm trying to calm him down, reassure him that I'm there, but I'm also looking at his SPG and really starting to get worried. It's getting close to the point where I need to decide if I'm going to stay. 
So I'm doing math, trying to come up with no kidding how much longer I can stay before it becomes the difference between one or two bodies, which is about the worst feeling you can imagine. Thankfully, he caught his breath and we started scootering out. He was still way positive, and about 50 feet later, his tanks hit the ceiling hard. I watched like slow motion as a chunk of rock fell from the ceiling and straight through his spinning prop, which immediately separated and flew into the silt. Now he's in a silt cloud with a broken scooter looking totally confused. I took his scooter and handed him the tow while I towed his way on my butted ring and we kept going. I never switched to my stage. I wanted no part of a gas sharing scooter ride the way things were going and I wanted to be able to hand that off. The ride out was ugly, but we made it. Unfortunately, now that we were in essentially open water with a hundred minutes of deco, and his positive buoyancy was so bad that he was hanging on the back of 70 foot rock with both hands. His light head was on an EO cord and had disconnected and fallen into the silt. I was seriously worried that he was going feet first to the surface with a scary amount of omitted deco slash rapid ascent. That's when I noticed that he looked like the Michelin man. I checked his shoulder dump valve and realized that it was fully closed. I opened it up and he sank down to the rock, but was still mentally out of it. So I clipped his 70 bottle to a shoulder D-ring and worked his gas switch for him just to be safe. His head started to clear around the 40 foot stop and he was fine by the time we surfaced. I don't know if he started to dive with his shoulder dump closed or if it happened approaching the second stage drop where he apparently sucked some water during the switch to back gas and had to brace himself on the wall. Either way, it's the closest I've ever come to thinking that I was about to see someone die and the closest I've come to actually having to make the decision to leave someone. Another five to 10 minutes at 150 feet and he would have been pulling a vacuum in his doubles approaching the 70 bottles. It was a few minutes from being a nightmare situation and I'm thankful that it didn't come to that. A couple months ago, a guide took his friends to Dos Ojos in Tolum and took them off the cavern line. One got lost, swam farther into the cave, and luckily found a small, probably not too fresh, air pocket in the ceiling, where he survived, floating for quite some time before being found and rescued. Moral of the story, don't always blindly trust your guide. Keep an awareness of the line you're following, and ideally don't swim beyond reach of it. I was cave diving solo, second dive of the day, and had recalculated my thirds to do one little last jump on a line near the exit. My thirds of gas, but not of battery life on my primary light. I was 15 minutes swim from the exit when the light went out. Luckily, I was close to the line and was able to grab it while I took out my backup light. But I had put the battery in upside down and didn't test it. It didn't come on. So I fished out my second backup for my pouch but it didn't come on. Maybe it turned on in the pouch and drained the battery without me realizing. So I'm in the blackest black darkness I've ever experienced, quite a ways from daylight, completely alone. Luckily, I had a ton of gas left as I was carrying my third tank that I hadn't breathed from at all. I was planning on hanging on to it for the dive the next day. Anyway, in that moment, it was like a wall came down between my mind and any doubt in myself or fear of death. Not even for a millisecond did I let myself dwell on the gravity of the situation. I calmly made my way out by touch, along the line the whole way. My eyes eventually adjusted so that the dim light from my computer lit the two inches in front of me. I used it to navigate tie-offs. The rays of light in the entrance were the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Forever grateful for Zabalba, the Mayan mythical underworld in the Sintos letting me out of there that time. Moral of the story, 
always check your backup lines. There's a book out there called Close Calls if you want more stories. One of the most horrific things I've ever seen on Reddit. The person who posted the comment was looking into cave diving, and he found an older gentleman online willing to sell his gear. He had to ask him why he was selling it after doing it for so long. Him and two other guys were down in the caves. He said the two were the best of friends. He made it out, but they kicked up silt as they tried to leave. When they retrieved the men's bodies, they both had stab wounds all over them. One of the men brought an extra oxygen tank, and all they could figure was the two fought to the death over it. Truly, truly scary. Two guys who were so close, killing each other for a slim chance of survival. The OP decided he didn't want to try cave diving anymore. I went cave diving with my dive buddy. His friend who has limited experience comes along. My buddy assures me that he has dived with him before and he's really good. Okay, cool. Take the lead, laying out line, constantly checking they are good. Visibility is about two meters, so not bad. Go through a few squeezes. Here, the visibility drops to zero as we stir up silt wriggling through the tight spots. I see my buddy's friend is wide-eyed Get him to calm down. Sign of him. Heaps of air left, mate. We aren't even far in. Just relax. Get to another squeeze. New territory for me in this cave. Signal them to stay here and don't follow me until I scope it out as I lay the line. Go through a longer squeeze. Maybe five meters long. Arms fully extended in front of me wriggling. I barely can fit through. Come out into a big chamber where the visibility is excellent. Hell yeah. Hover there for maybe two minutes, completely motionless, just taking it in. Chamber is probably 15 meters wide where the squeeze comes out, about the same depth. Torch penetrates maybe 40 meters ahead before Viz obscures it. Hell yeah. Go to tie off on a static line, and notice that the line has gone slack. Go back to the squeeze entrance and pull on the line. Completely slack, two meters of it slide out in front of me. Brain takes a second to process. Crap. Apparently my buddy's friend had tried to follow me in, got stuck in the squeeze, thrashed around and snapped the line. Freaking out, he got out of the squeeze and bolted back the way we came. Buddy follows him not realizing the line has snapped and hooked on him, completely stirred up the silt. Viz is now zero. Shimmy back through the squeeze. Feel I've come out of it but literally cannot see my hand unless I press it onto my mask proceed to crap myself. Zero visibility. Feeling around blindly. Can't find the snapped off line anywhere. My friend is nowhere to be seen. Silt will take hours to clear. By then I'll be out of air and dead. Brain starts going into full panic mode. I force myself to calm down. Panic and you die. I start trying to make my way by feel and memory. Not sure if I'm coming through the right way or around in circles. I come to a squeeze and hope that I'm not going the wrong way. Wrong turn means death. Exit the squeeze. It felt like the right length. Trying to remember the route. Panic is making it hard. Finning along for what seems like an eternity. Dragging one hand along the bottom. One on the side of the cave to stay oriented. I hit a piece of a cave that I think I recognize the shape of. From three stalactites close to the side of the cave. Holy cow, this is good news. Wow. Those guys really silted this place out bad. I continue on. Come to another squeeze. Seems like it's the right one. Wrong. After three meters, the squeeze closes down and is a dead end. I realize I was wrong about the squeeze. I felt so effed. I try to stay calm. If I freak out, I'm just going to chew through my air faster. I wriggle backwards and... 
extricate myself. Press my computer into my mask. Shows I've been alone for 25 minutes. Can't see my gauges. No idea how much air is left. I find another squeeze to go through. Start moving faster. If I don't get out soon, I'm effed. Not sure where I am at this point and starting to fully panic. Booting it hard. Slam headfirst into something. A hand grabs my arm. My buddy came back. He noticed what happened to the line and laid his own. I literally started crying. Hard to keep the regulator in through sobs of relief. 25 minutes of blind memory work and I was only 10 minutes from the exit. We get out. My buddy tells me what happened. Punched the other guy in the face. Took a few months off of diving after that. Thank you all so much for listening to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed all the stories. I want to give a special shout out to all of our channel members. Thank you so much to Emily Tippins, Adam Wagner, Miss Janet 64, Derek Slank, Helga Andreas, Michael Smith, Burberry's Fables, Samantha Scotton, Glenda's Voiceover Projects, Maxine Gentile, Sad Fish, Inner Scare Wifey Simp, Pilot, Vanita Tillman, Sarah Rodriguez, Shane Wilson, Sarah Wood, Jacob Ryumi, Claire, Sherry Uchel, Zane Loggins, Martha APS, Hail Mary, Gingerbread, Carrie Morris, Crystal, Brown Doe, Jado, Chili MC, Snowing Wine Drops, Tina Mead, Taylor Ruist, Casey Brown, Caroline Hawksworth, Eric Donter, The Grim Reaper's Nightmare, Simply Complicated, Tangela Young, Miss Cannabis, Anon Q, Mathematica, Christy Goodall, Skin Crawler, Ruby Wilson, Jennifer Moyer, Classic Sonic the Hedgehog, Cappy Karma, and Paul Reese. Thank you all so much for being members. And thank you to each and every one of you who has watched this video. I really, really appreciate it. Please like, comment, and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. But without further ado, I hope you all enjoy the extra rain at the end of this video. Good night, everybody.